At the very basic level, neuromorphic computing is throwing out everything we think we know about computers and processors and computing in general and um, looking from a very first principles basis at how biological brains compute and um, trying to extract lessons from that, the way that biology computes, and see what's applicable given the design tools that we have available to us today. So neuromorphic systems will, will solve um, problems that involve interacting with real world data in time. Um, so any sort of data stream that involves uh, a dynamic element to it. So um, speech and video, um, robotics where you're moving things through space in time and responding in a very uh, you know, short time frame to, uh, to external events, especially where there's unexpected adaptation that's required. So power is a critical problem to, to making neural networks pervasive. And, th and that is one of the key uh, uh, promises of neuromorphic technology because there gets a little technical, but at the very fundamental level, uh, the brain circuits and the circuits that we're trying to implement in, in neuromorphic chips are normally off. They're inactive. So they don't communicate at all times. They only communicate you know, intermittently as they have information and input that needs to be handled. Certainly at the edge devices, so processing visual streams and making sense of visual input, especially in this event-based manner, so uh, in, in uh, uh, mobile environments where either the camera or the world is moving, uh, the, that's going to be a really great match for neuromorphic processing at very low power. Uh, but also, if you go all the way to the other extreme, and you can find examples in the data center, uh, so uh, we're, we're building large neuromorphic systems that have hundreds of chips in them, and that's so that we can scale up problems. And, and, and as an example, we might be able to solve um, optimization problems. Yeah, one of the exciting things about neuromorphic computing is uh, that it's not a, just a one-way street. So we're getting all kinds of important insight and understanding from neuroscience. But through that process of working with the neuroscience scientists and, and abstracting those low-level models they have, we can confirm the theories they have, that they in fact work. So there's an example of that where we're working with uh, Tom Cleland, a neuroscientist at, uh, at Cornell. And he studies the way that uh, organisms smell through the olfactory system. And, uh, and, and so th that's uh, an example where we've abstracted these low-level models, run them on our chips, and, and that confirms the, the, his, his work, his research.